I live in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains in northeast Georgia. It's a beautiful area with hundreds of miles of national forests, some great state parks, and a ton of fantastic camping places. Unfortunately, my hometown is also relatively poor. While there are some out-of-town residents from Atlanta and other places, a lot of people where I live are really poor. I do freelance work as a technical writer, so I can do most of my work online. If I didn't have that going for me, I'd have to move somewhere else. It's just one of those small towns that will rob you of your ability to accomplish anything in life if you stay there too long, without anything else going for you at least. Excluding a handful of doctors and lawyers and Georgia Power Company employees, the only employment in the area is at Walmart, fast food, and a couple of grocery stores. To the east of my town, there's a massive national forest. It's loaded with great camping sites and lots of relatively unused hiking trails. I really enjoy hiking on them with my dog, but it can be a bit of an unnerving experience sometimes. It's about a 10 mile drive from town, and there's no cell phone service or homes for miles. In the past, there have been lots of vehicle break-ins at the trailheads. The gravel parking lots at some of them glitter with bits of broken glass from what I'm guessing were car windows. Sometimes, there are really shifty people hanging around these trailheads or just driving around the forest service roads. These are really rough roads, and you'll see these beat up $500 cars just barreling along roads meant for a 4x4. Some of the people you see in the cars look like the guy that got crushed by an ATM in Breaking Bad. All that being said, it's still a great place to camp. However, you just have to be careful. A few years ago, two of my friends and I decided to go play paintball in the National Forest. Probably not legal, I know. We decided to turn the paintball expedition into a camping trip so we could play the next morning too. After a pretty uneventful day of shooting paintballs at each other, we drive a couple of miles to one of the more popular camping spots. Unfortunately, a church group or something had taken up all the spots in the area. This is really the only camping spot that we were familiar with and it was getting pretty late. We decide to keep on looking, so we drive for about an hour further and further into the woods. By this time, it's getting a bit dark, and we're getting a bit worried about finding a spot. We all had GPS on our smartphones, but none of us had any service. We turn off onto an unfamiliar road that isn't in very good shape. In fact, it looks like the forest service rangers used a backhoe to block off the road with a mount of dirt. A broken metal barrier lay in the woods nearby. That said, it looked like 4x4 vehicles had been going over the mound, so it was pretty worn down. Our F-150 had pretty high clearance, so we decided to go over the mound. There was an old gravel road on the other side, and the road was pretty much clear of debris. We drove a few miles down this road and came across an opening next to a small creek. There were some blue tarps hanging over a plywood table nailed to a tree, which seemed kind of odd. That said, it was pretty much dark at this point and we didn't want to keep driving around all night looking for a camping spot. We left the truck light running and we set up the tent. As we were setting up tent, I started to notice that there was a lot of trash in the surrounding woods. I see a green bottle laying on the ground. I take a look at the label and I see that it's a bottle of home and garden insecticide. I was really tired at the time, and I just thought that someone had been dumping their home garbage out here. None of us thought it was weird that someone would be dumping garbage in an area that is more than an hour from the nearest home. We set up camp, had some beers, and made chili from scratch. By this time, it was probably around 11 p.m., as we were eating, we noticed a faint glow from the other side of a nearby hill. At first, 
we thought it was moonlight filtering its way through the trees. However, the angles didn't make sense. It didn't seem to be a bright light, and it wasn't moving. It was kind of like that glow you'd see over a bright city. We couldn't see the light self its source, though. Since there was no other access to roads in the area, we decided it wasn't other campers. The hill was about a quarter mile from our campsite, so we decided to go investigate. Under normal circumstances, I know I wouldn't have done so. However, we all had a few rum and cokes in our stomachs, and two of us, Jacob and I, decided to take a look. My other friend Isaac decides to stay behind to pop some popcorn over the fire. We start walking towards the light source, and the situation gets even stranger. All the trees in the area have their bark knocked off in a circle around their trunks. We thought it could have been the work of a beaver that lived in the creek, but it seems strange that a beaver would go around to all these trees and just knock the bark off in a circle. Jacob and I start talking about the ghost beaver in pretty loud voices, probably due to our drunkenness. As we're almost to the top of the hill, Jacob tripped and yelled, Oh shit! A few seconds after he yelled, the light, whatever it was, went out. We looked at each other and decided that maybe we don't need to see what that light was after all. We walk back in silence and keep looking back every few seconds. We decide to turn off our flashlight and just use the moonlight to get back to the campsite. When we got a couple of hundred feet from the campsite, I can see my other friend Isaac walking around the campsite. He was wearing a hooded coat that I hadn't seen him wearing before. For some reason, he's carrying his paintball gun around in his hand. It seemed a little odd, we said to each other. The fire had started to die down, so we couldn't see our campsite very well. At this point, we'd probably been gone for almost an hour. From the distance, it looked like Isaac was looking for something. He kept walking around the site and was peering in the tent. When we were almost back to the campsite, we saw Isaac walk up to the road we came in on. We figured that he was going to go use the bathroom and didn't want to wander through the woods like us. When we got back, we sat next to the fire and waited for Isaac to come back. All of a sudden, we see him lurch out of the tent. He stumbles a few feet and vomits. After we left, he had a few more rum and cokes, he mumbles. We ask him why he kept wandering around the campsite with the paintball gun and he gets a strange look in his face. They're locked up in the cab of the truck. D did you unlock it? We go and check the truck, enter the door code, and see all our paintball equipment just as we left it before. The keys to the truck were still hidden in a magnetic fob underneath. I get a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. Isaac, what were you doing after we left? I ask. Um, I was just watching a movie on my phone, and then I fell asleep, I guess. But you were walking around with your paintball gun, right? Did you just change jackets? Isaac said he had been in the tent since we left, that he had been wearing the same unhooded fleece all night. Someone had been walking around our campsite, and it wasn't Isaac. At this point, all of us are way too drunk to drive, but we decide to go ahead and pack up and go back to my house for the night. We don't bother packing up the tent, we just fold it down with sleeping bags and everything in it. We jump in the F-150, and I start to drive out. When we get to the dirt hump, we see something gray blocking our path. The metal barrier that had been lying in the woods earlier is now back on its stand, right on top of the hump earlier. By this point, all of us had sobered up to the situation. 
no one wants to get out of the car to try to move the barrier. I had a metal guard in front of the F-150, so I drive forward slowly, tapping the metal barrier with the front of my truck. It falls right off. It must have just been balanced on top, and we drive slowly over it. We were terrified that it would pop one of the truck's tires as we drove over it, but it didn't. As we drive down the road, we see a vehicle following us with its lights off. It's probably about a thousand feet behind us, but we keep catching glimpses of it as the moon reflects light off it. I start to drive as fast as I can on the forest service road, and the other vehicle keeps pace. It doesn't get any closer though. It stays just one or two turns behind us. We can only see it when the road straightens out. After about 45 minutes of speeding along gravel roads, we make it back to the main paved road. I start to drive everyone back to my house, but I decide to go a different way just to be safe. I didn't get pulled over for a DUI, luckily. Camping can be fun, but very rural camping can be dangerous. I've driven past that metal barrier since that time, but it's always been in place. I would never go down that road again. For reference, I was a 19-year-old female at the time. Still female, of course, just a little older. I love camping. Anytime my friends and I came home from college, we would load up our cooler and beer, grab some gear and go screw around outside. Unfortunately, when I was actually at school, none of my sorority sisters or other friends ever wanted to go with me, so I would often suffer withdrawals from camping. One day, the weather was way too nice to waste, so I grabbed some of my gear, hopped in a car I borrowed from a buddy, and drove to a spot that was secluded yet within a safe distance to civilization that I could run and get help. Camping also creeps me out sometimes, but that creepy feeling is also somewhat of a pulse for me. It's the same reason that people read these stories. It's fun to be scared. So I make a little camp and get a fire going. I hadn't brought all that much to eat, but I was enjoying myself. Reading and looking around the area, that sort of thing. I got the feeling I was being watched, and I stopped dead in my tracks. I hear a twig crunch over to my right, then see a doe bolt from a hundred feet or so in front of me. I laughed at myself and went back to the camp with an armful of wood I had gathered. I kept freaking myself out, hearing sounds just outside of the ring of light casted by the fire. I always get inside my head, so I shrugged it off and kept whittling at the stick I had been messing with. Around one, I decided to go into my tent and snuff out the lantern. I had been slamming beer in the most unladylike fashion, and smoking cheap cigars. Another reason I like camping, I can't act however I want. So I passed out relatively quick. About 2am, I start hearing footsteps. They sound pretty light, and sort of timid. I think to myself that it's a deer or another animal. More likely a raccoon because I had probably left some food out. I'm still on guard though. About 30 minutes of sleeping with one eye open, I hear a rubbing noise. And the tent fabric is being pushed in a bit. I don't know how I didn't shit my sleeping bag, but I just sat there paralyzed with my ka bar in my hand. I desperately wanted to thrust the knife through the tent fabric, but I was still holding out hope that it was some of my buddies from the frat joking with me. And then as sudden as it had begun, it all stopped. I was starting to feel slightly more secure because daylight would be coming in about two or three hours, but I sure as shit wasn't going to go to sleep. All of a sudden at about four o'clock, I realized I should put my boots on so that if anything did happen, I would be ready. After having stayed up and keeping alert a little while longer, my friend's car alarm goes blaring. I freak the fuck out and run out of the tent. I got about two steps before something grabs me around the mouth. I open my mouth to scream, but instead the person's pinky finger slips between my teeth. I have heard that people can perform superhuman feats when they have huge adrenaline rushes. In my case, I just clamp down and there's no way to say this without sounding ridiculous. His finger 
popped off. He screamed, pulled his hand away with his missing digit falling to the ground. He took off running down the hill I was camping on. I took off right quick in the opposite direction. I must have looked ridiculous to people whose house I ran to. A little sorority girl in a wife beater, boxers, and steel toe boots. I also had some blood that had oozed out of my lip, not from the finger, but because I have also managed to take a pretty big chunk out of my lip as well. I told them what happened, they called the police, got me some real clothing, and the man at the house made me a whiskey and coke. When the cops got there, they checked it out. The cops went to check it out, and when they came back, it was light out. They brought me back so I could get my friend's car, and what I saw just made me more scared. Right next to the tent was a red gas can. He could have just lit me on fire earlier. The finger was also gone, suggesting he had come back. The kicker is they never caught the guy. So somewhere out there is a man sitting down to dinner, maybe alone, maybe with a wife and a couple of kids, and he's missing his right pinky. Background. I work summers as a camp counselor in the northern part of Ontario, Canada. On the date this particular incident occurred, I was camping with a group of 10 year old boys on the same lake the summer camp was based on. So like a routine camping trip, we canoed out to the site and set up our tents. Me and my co-counselor, Mike, take turns supervising the kids while they swim, build forts and play games, etc. We cook some food over the fire sit around and tell stories, cook s'mores, the typical Canadian camping experience. Around 9.30ish, I tell the kids it's time for bed, and they head into their tents, which were positioned a small walk away from the shoreline, but still in line of sight from where we had our fire pit. So the kids have gone to bed, and me and Mike are shooting a shit by the water smoking a cigarette, just basically hanging out before we decide to head into our tents and call it a night. What happened next still troubles me to this day, and remains my go-to scary campfire story. We were both gazing into the pitch black night water, when we saw a small light approaching us slowly and slightly above water level. We speculated what it could possibly be for a few minutes, before it came close enough for us to see that it was mounted on the front of a kayak, and that someone was approaching our campsite. Now, it is important to note that as a camp counselor, Part of our training goes over how to deal with stranger encounters in an environment where we are responsible for a group of children on a public property. I was prepared to give the mystery paddler the typical speech about how we are camping with a group from a recognized organization, and we would respectfully ask if they could find another campsite. However, this person's appearance shook me to the bone as the light drew nearer. Paddling this kayak was a woman who looked to be in her 60s. She had incredibly long wisps of grey hair that was trailing in the water. Her skin looked like old leather, and her dead looking eyes were tough to spot under all her wrinkles. She looked directly at me, and when she spoke, I realized she was missing most of her teeth. Are all your children safe in bed? She asked, me pointing in the direction of the tents, not really knowing how to respond and quite frankly shitting myself. I responded by telling her that they were fine and she had to leave. That's good, just as expected for this time. She said with a smile, then turned her kayak and paddled off into the night. At this point in time, myself and Mike were legitimately very creeped out, not only by the appearance of this mystery woman, who resembled a freaking corpse, but also her inquiry on the whereabouts and safety of the kids we had brought on the trip. Not knowing what else to do, we grabbed our hunting knives and sat by the fire after checking on the kids. Half an hour later is where shit started to get really creepy. Across the lake, a female counselor was leading another trip for kids the same age group. She sent me a text which read something along the lines of, Hey, Sean, stop screwing with us. This isn't funny. My kids are really creeped out. I instantly called her and let her know that I just saw someone near my campsite that seemed eerie, and that I was not trying to play a joke. Apparently one of their kids had opened their tent door to take a piss, and seen a woman with long hair standing with her arms open towards them near the shoreline.
In May 2009, I had just broken up with my girlfriend of almost three years. We had moved from Calgary to Toronto, and were still stuck living together after the breakup, as we didn't know many people in the city yet. Needless to say, the situation was pretty stressful and upsetting, so when a buddy I was going to school with at the time suggested a weekend camping-slash-fishing trip, I jumped at the chance. He grew up in an area about an hour outside of Toronto called Flamborough. It's really beautiful. Loads of lush forest, farmers' fields, and small rivers and creeks. We decided to camp and fish along a creek called Grindstone Creek. It's close to some wetlands and the fishing is supposed to be great. We ended up setting up our camp in what was probably a farmer's field. I'm guessing it was trespassing on our part, bordered by a gorgeous forest. We spent the evening fishing, shooting the shit, and drinking some quality craft beers. As it got darker, we made a little fire and roasted potatoes and hot dogs. All in all, it was a really good night. We turned in just after midnight and we shared a tent. My buddy fell asleep before me and I stayed up playing on my phone until probably about 1.30. I must have drifted off because the next thing I remember was being woken up by a high-pitched yipping type noise. I was kind of groggy and it took me a moment to fully wake up. The yipping was incessant, and it sounded like a weird coyote. I laid there for a moment listening, and then started playing on my phone again, and the noise was annoying as hell. I tried ignoring it, but it sounded like it was getting closer. Finally, it sounded like it had to be no more than 10 feet from the tent. At this point, I was getting a little unsettled. I had seen coyotes in Calgary before, and I thought of them as pretty harmless. They never looked much bigger than a smallish dog. But what if this one was rabbit or something? What if it could smell our food? I had a pretty bad anxiety disorder, so I'm prone to worrying about these types of things. I nudged my buddy to see if he was awake, and he was. The noise woke him up too. We discussed what to do about the coyote, and as we hadn't brought anything to scare off critters, not a BB gun, nothing. Finally he decided he would shine the flashlight on it and holler a lot, hopefully scaring him off. He unzipped the tent and I watched him pointing the flashlight out into the darkness. I'll never forget what happened next. His leg suddenly went all wobbly, and he sort of stumbled backwards into the tent. He had a really dumbfounded look on his face when he looked at me and babbled, it, it, It's not a coyote. It's a dude. It's some weird dude. Normally, I would have thought he was messing with me. I'm a huge wimp and scare easily. I won't even watch horror movies. But I've never seen someone that looked that scared, and I never want to see that expression on someone's face again. So I knew he wasn't pulling my leg. The weird yipping and howling type noises were still going on, and in retrospect, it really didn't sound like a coyote, but I guess in our groggy states it was a way for our brains to make sense of it. Anyways, he kept telling me to just look out the tent flap, to make sure he's not crazy. At this point, I was having a full-blown anxiety attack. My heart was racing. I felt like shit, but I had to look. So I slowly peeked out the flap and waited for my eyes to adjust. And that's when I saw him. He was standing only a few arms lengths away from the tent. He was swaying a little and wearing a baseball cap. What made it awful though what was really creepy was that he was wearing women's lingerie. That's when I knew there was most likely something very wrong with this guy. If the making high-pitched noises at strangers' tents in the middle of the night didn't give it away. 
After I pulled my head back inside the tent, my buddy and I discussed what to do. Finally, we decided to yell at the guy to fuck off. My buddy started yelling, Excuse me, can you fuck off? We're trying to sleep in here. The noise stopped. It was dead silent. And that's when we heard footsteps running towards our tent. They stopped right outside the tent, but we didn't waste any time and we started yelling again. Seriously, fuck off! We have a cell phone in here, and if you don't fuck off, we're going to call the cops. With that, we heard him walk by the tent and head off. Sounded like he was moving towards the road. Needless to say, we laid awake, petrified until the first sight of sunlight. Then we hightailed it the hell out of there. We discussed our experience on the way home and were both pretty embarrassed about how scared we got. It definitely was not manly on either of our parts, and I think because we were both ashamed of how we let some weirdo freak us out so much, we really haven't ever talked about that day since. I'm a uni student now, but this incident happened when I was in the 8th grade. When I was around 14, I studied a subject, focusing on outdoor pursuits, for our final assessment. Two teachers took my class on a one-night camp where we could do activities like rock climbing, kayaking, trail walking, etc. I live in Australia, around an hour from a state forest that was notorious for the backpacker murders. Several bodies have been found, and several more remaining missing. I'm pretty sure all of the murders were linked to the same serial killer. Anyway, in the morning we leave the school and drive out in the bus. When we reach the road that leads to the entrance to the forest, a police car is parked to the side. He spoke to the teacher for a moment, but I didn't hear anything and no one else seemed to notice or care. Fast forward a few hours and we're trekked, about 20 of us, to the camping area, somewhere in the middle of the state forest. Some parts are state, some are privately owned, I think. Whilst kayaking that afternoon, we noticed a helicopter doing flybys, but again my classmates never suspected anything. A couple of mates and I were the first to leave the water, and helped the teacher with some equipment and started building our own rafts. I was standing off to the side when one of the national park guides walked over to one of the instructors and talked in a hushed, slightly stressed out tone. I remember hearing the instructor say stuff like, You're kidding. I don't believe it. He just looked shocked and taken aback. So at this point, I started connecting the dots, but I didn't say anything to my school friends. Around dusk that night, I got to use the toilet block, which is around 100 meters from the main campsite. As I go in, I remember a guy walking around the other side of the block. I didn't see him very clearly in the diminished light, but he kept glancing around with nervous body language. I couldn't see his face clearly, it wasn't part of our party, and to me, it just didn't fit. I didn't think much of it at the time. Fast forward to the next morning, when we get back to the car park, the teacher tells us that a body was found in the dam, not far from where we were. They didn't want to tell us so as not to frighten us. We later found out it was a young guy who was killed with an axe, and the guy who did it was related to the serial killer who hunted in the same area. I don't know if that guy I saw had anything at all to do with the murders, but it freaked me out a lot afterwards. Haven't been camping since. This happened to my parents back in the late 80s. They were in their mid-20s when this all occurred. My parents decided to go camping in cool California. When they got there, it was kind of late. My mom was sitting down on a log while my dad was unpacking the truck. While sitting down, she heard walking from around the campsite. So she went and quietly told my dad she heard someone walking around. They got the fuck out of there, just in case. They drove about three miles down the road with their headlights off so they wouldn't be followed. Once they got there, they set up camp and began to drink their asses off while listening to a boxing match on the radio. Eventually, they settled in for the night. 
Now, they don't know for sure that this next event is connected to the first, but they believe it is. So they settled in, and my dad was asleep far before my mom. My mom was in the halfway state where they're halfway awake and halfway asleep. Suddenly, she heard the footsteps outside the tent. She abruptly snapped back to consciousness and listened. She tried waking my dad, but he was way too out of it. She listened for what seemed like hours, when suddenly she hears, in the creepiest voice you could probably ever imagine, say, Here I am. I'm going to kill you. While saying this, the man what she believes to be a knife along the tent. She could hear him walking and dragging the knife. She was literally frozen. She couldn't say anything or move. With her mouth agape, she finally snapped out of it and screamed, Jim! Grab the shotgun! Kill that son of a bitch! With that, my dad finally awoke. They heard snapping and twigs and footsteps, and heard the guy running away. Of course, my parents didn't have a shotgun. It was a huge bluff that actually worked. My dad got up seconds later and began to run after him, but he was long gone. After that, my parents decided they were going to get the fuck out of there before anything else happened. When they saw their tires were slashed, they were in the middle of nowhere and no way out with a maniac that wanted to kill them. They actually tried blowing up their tires with one of those things you use to blow up rafts. Obviously, that didn't work, but they had to try, right? About an hour or so later, a ranger that was patrolling the area came along to help them out. He brought them back to town so that they can get their tires fixed. While talking to the ranger, they found out that he had been searching for an, any suspicious activity due to recent murders nearby. My parents were likely the murderer's next victims. I tried finding some of the murder cases online, but was unable to.